All right. Welcome back. We're going to take a second look at Chapter 4 from a microbiology text. Um, we're studying the anatomy and physiology, the structure and function of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, microorganisms, and particularly those that cause disease. Um, <clears throat> in this second half, we're going to look at um, transport across the membrane, the cell membrane, various types of transport and so forth, and the mechanisms. Then we're going to look at eukaryotic flagella. We've already looked at prokaryotic flagella, and we'll see the eukaryotic flagella are a little bit more complicated, but you don't need to get way into that or anything. Um, and towards the end of the chapter, I'd like you to be able to say something about endosymbiotic theory. Um, very interesting notion, um, indeed. And we'll also be highlighting the difference between the 70S ribosome that we learned about in prokaryotes and the eukaryotic ribosomes. And those play a big part in our ability to design um, antibiotics that attack the ribosomes of bacteria without destroying the ribosomes of the host cells, of our body cells. So <clears throat> here's a, a bacterial shell, essentially. You can see the, the cell wall around the cell membrane. The gold color inner look, shell looking thing is the lipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Then comes the, the peptidoglycan cell wall. If this is this is, drawing is of a gram negative bacterium, so it has an outer membrane. If it was gram positive, it would not. <clears throat> so there's um there's a number of proteins associated in different ways with the cell membrane that play an important role. I'm just going to touch briefly on some of those different uh, types of membrane proteins. There are transmembrane proteins, which are receptors that can bind substances on the outside and signal to the inside of the cell. They also can act as transporters to carry things from outside to inside the cell or vice versa. They might be channels that just allow ions to pass through. Those are some examples of transmembrane proteins. Peripheral membrane proteins are associated with the membrane, such as right here right here, maybe attached on some of the actual phospholipids. Um, here's an example of a, of a receptor that's a transmembrane protein. When they're built into the membrane like that, they're called integral membrane proteins as well, as opposed to just transmembrane proteins. They're integrated into the membrane itself. They're anchored quite firmly in there. They're not going anywhere. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the membrane is interesting in that all of these little phospholipids can move around relative to one another. They stay in a sheet, but they can move around, and so can some of the proteins that are located in the in the membrane. They can glide all around there, like uh, like moving them among a bunch of magnets. And that's kind of a cool thing. The cytoskeleton of cells does limit how much proteins can move and where they can go, but to some degree they have fluidity uh, equivalent to something like a viscosity of olive oil. All right. <clears throat> the membrane has selective permeability. That's how um, cells can do what they do. They need to be able to control what's on the inside versus what's on the outside. They need to be able to collect nutrients, for example, into the cell and accumulate them and hold them. They need to be able to synthesize a lot of metabolic products and so forth that stay inside the cell for the functioning of the cell, and they can't all leak out and so forth. So the membrane is a semi-permeable boundary on the surface of the cell. Um, there are also some interesting features of microbes in which the membrane is folded in on itself, not completely separated, but folded in on itself so that there are stacks of essentially intracellular structures um, made out of plasma membrane. We'll take a look at that and you can see a little better what I mean. Let's move on to a cartoon uh, drawing of this. And I guess we're not going to do that right now. We'll see some of those infolded um, structures in a little bit. <clears throat> um, disinfectants are, are chemicals, chemical solutions oftentimes that we use to control microbial growth or the presence of microbes. And one of the key ways that some of them work is to destroy or damage the plasma membrane so the cells can no longer control their contents and they die. Um, alcohols, for example, you've probably seen many times alcohols used to clean the skin before giving a an injection or something of that nature, or cleaning a lab bench. Well, alcohols work by uh, dissolving and ruining this, the plasma mem membrane of, of, of microbes. Quaternary ammonium compounds are a type of detergent that also is very good at destroying the plasma membrane. And for example, surgeons, before they 
uh, go in to do a surgery, scrub their hands uh, extensively with quaternary ammonium compounds to get rid of living microorganisms on their skin. And then, of course, they glove up in addition to that. <clears throat> Polymyxin antibiotics are peptide antibiotics. They're chains of amino acids that are designed in such a way that they, um, they penetrate and damage the cell membrane. That's how the antibiotic means antibacterial uh, will damage those cells or kill those cells. And, um, and, the, and those, those polymyxins work by damaging the cell membrane. All right, that was a little aside about the cell membrane. Um, let's talk about transport across the cell membrane. First, we'll define diffusion. What is that? And if you have a region of a solution in water in which there's a, a, con a concentration of a solute in one location, and you wait for any period of time, it will diffuse and move towards regions where there's lower concentration. That's called diffusion. It's, it's based on the kinetic energy that the molecules or atoms have. They just have so much energy. When you put them in water, they're zooming all over the place randomly. And if there's a lot of them in one place, they'll eventually move to fill in all the area where there's less of them. That's called net diffusion or simple diffusion. So substances in water will move from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration just spontaneously. We call those passive processes. No energy has to be invested at all. Um, <clears throat> one way that can happen is if you have a lipid-soluble substance that can pass through the plasma membrane, and you have a lot of it on one side of the membrane, it'll diffuse right across into the other, for example, oxygen. If you have a cell that needs oxygen, it can get it. If there's some outside the cell, it can travel right across the membrane without any impediment uh, right inside the cell. It's called simple diffusion. In most cases, though, solutes that are larger or have an electric charge can't cross the plasma membrane on their own unassisted. And so membrane proteins act as transporters. Integral or trans uh, membrane proteins allow the movement of solutes across the membrane. And when they do so, that's called facilitated diffusion. We're still depending on a difference in concentration between outside and inside the cell to drive this process, but it's just that there's a carrier to, sh to shuttle the solutes across the membrane. So here's a little schematic diagram of, of one type of a facilitated diffusion in which um, a transporter just lets stuff diffuse right down through. And it could be nonspecific, a lot of small solutes be able to go through there, or it could be an ion channel or something like that. <clears throat> in this case, we see a transporter, a protein that can change conformation or shape. And so when the protein is in this particular shape in the left-hand uh, drawing, there's a binding site for some solute, possibly a sugar molecule from the fact that it's shaped like a little hexagon. And the sugar molecule will bind to its binding site. When that happens, it'll induce a change in conformation of the protein, and it will flip to its opposite conformation. And now that, that glucose molecule is free to diffuse across or diffuse out into the cytoplasm of the cell. And the minute that glucose is released, then this, the protein pops back to its former conformation and so forth. So if there's a lot of glucose molecules here outside the cell, it will be transported in, but it still depends on that concentration gradient. When there's a concentration difference, we call that a protein, a concentration gradient from high to low, facilitated diffusion using a transporter. Um, diffusion of water, it's just diffusion, but when diff water molecules diffuse from a region of high water concentration to lower water concentration, um, we call that osmosis, it just has its own special name. Um, what do I mean by that? Pure water has the highest water concentration, and the more solute you add to the water, the lower the water concentration. So pure water, uh, when placed on the opposite of membrane with a solution that has solute in it, water will move across that membrane towards that solute because it's higher concentration outside where the water is. So that's called osmosis, very powerful force. If we think about the inside of the cell I was just describing, which there's a lot of solute in there and, the, and there's nothing but water outside, <clears throat> and that water is diffusing in by osmosis, osmotic pressure is a measure of how much attractive force does all that solute inside the cell have on the water, making it, making it diffuse by osmosis, or what force or pressure would it take to oppose that movement of water so it would just exactly be in balance. It's called osmotic pressure. How hard is the water pushing inward uh, by, the for, by, uh, by osmosis against that uh, concentration gradient? 
osmotic pressure. The solutes in the higher concentrated um, region will have osmotic pressure. <clears throat> uh, many times, though, in water, for one, in order for water to diffuse across the membrane, there needs to be a pathway, and that pathway may very well be aquaporins. Integral membrane proteins that are actually water channels and let the water molecules diffuse across the semi-permeable uh, membrane. Uh, water can't cross the appreciably, can't cross the uh, lipid bilayer without a aquaporin. Some can get through, but uh, not a significant amount. So here's a little drawing of a, of a lipid bilayer, plasma membrane, and an aquaporin that allows water molecules to pass through freely uh, when there's a difference in water concentration because it's very, very difficult for water molecules to weasel their way through this. The inner part of the membrane is very lipid um, um, friendly. It's sort of like when you mix water and plant oils like vegetable oil in a measuring cup. You can picture in your mind, I'm sure you've done this in grade school, you see that they don't mix. You have two layers. Well, the inside of the membrane is much like the oil layer that won't mix with water it's very hydrophobic, not water-loving out there. The heads of these phospholipids are charged, and they're hydrophilic. They love water, and water sticks there, but it doesn't cross easily into the cell. But the aquaporin lets it pass right through. Uh, here's a little setup to illustrate uh, osmosis happening. And here we have a beaker of water. Little blue dots are just water molecules. Excuse me. And here's a, a, a membrane that's been wrapped around this little rod to get something to hold on to it with. And so it's sealed up in there. And inside that, that membrane, this in this case, it's cellulose. Cellophane is like a, a, a type of cellulose membrane. And inside there are, are some, is some, uh, some sucrose, which is just a disaccharide, two sugar molecules bonded together. Um, and the sucrose cannot cross the membrane. It's too large to fit through the microscopic pores that exist in the cellulose. So what'll happen in the long run? Because there's a lower water concentration inside the membrane, right? Highest possible water concentration outside, there's no solute. Lower water concentration inside where the sucrose is, water will enter, I'm sorry, I should point to this one first. Water will enter this membrane by osmosis until it swells up to the point where every time a water molecule passes in, another one passes back out again. That's called equilibrium. You have equal movement in either direction. There's, that's because there's already now some pressure inside here that's opposing the osmosis, some physical water pressure in here that's opposing the osmosis and things have come into balance. You can tell there's pressure in there because it's pushed water upwards against the force of gravity in this little glass tube here, um, and it, illustrating the pressure that's in here. That's, that's the osmotic pressure exerted by these these sucrose molecules on that water. But the point really is just that if you have a difference in concentration of water across this membrane and it's permeable to water, water will pass through the membrane by osmosis. Bacteria don't really have any mechanism or feature for controlling cell volume. All the cells in your body, a lot of all animal cells have some way to control the cell volume. They do it by way of a sodium potassium pump located in the membrane and but bacteria don't worry about stuff like that because they have a, excuse me, a strong cell wall on the surface and they have a lot more solute inside than outside the cell, but that's okay. Water tries to enter by osmosis until some pressure builds up inside that little bullet-like bacterium against the cell wall and then no more water can enter and so it doesn't make a lick of difference. So the cell can transport all the solute inside at once and water can't uh, hurt the cell at all. But that's why when we were talking about um, agents that's, that damage the cell membrane, like uh, antibiotics uh, that that hard, harm the cell membrane, then the membrane, then the cell will burst, and so that's how we can attack bacteria in some ways by adding some chemicals, some detergents, or some antibiotics that uh, interfere with the cell membrane. And then, because they have no mechanism to control volume, they'll swell and burst. Okay, let's talk about tonicity. Tonicity is a is a way of describing a solution relative to the concentration of the cytoplasm of a cell. So in this picture right here, we see that there's more solute molecules, little dots drawn inside the cell than outside. And then therefore there's a difference in water concentration and water will enter this cell by osmosis until there's a pressure inside that's equal to that, that uh, osmotic pressure. If the cell wall isn't strong enough, the cell will burst in lice as the water forces its way in there. This lower 
solute concentration or higher water concentration solution on the outside is called a hypotonic solution. It has a lower concentration of solutes than what's in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now over in this example, we see a uh, bacterium, it looks like in this case again, which is placed in a solution that has more solute dissolved in it than what's in the cytoplasm of the bacterium. And this is called a hypertonic solution. And so now the higher water concentration is on the inside and water will diffuse out by osmosis and the cell will shrivel up. Another way of controlling uh, microbial growth is by placing them in a hypertonic solution and their, and their cytoplasm shrivels right up and they can't grow and divide. And in fact, uh, one of the key ways that um, foods were preserved before refrigeration was a thing was by using hypertonic solution. For example, salt beef. Have you ever heard of salting meat or producing jerky? The reason for doing that is to put a hypertonic solution around any bacteria that might be on the food or on the meat. And the bacteria would not be able to, to divide and grow because of the hypertonic solution. Also, I'm taking fruits like pears or peaches and cutting them up, skinning them, cutting them up, and putting them in, in concentrated sugar solutions. And boy, is that good. Um, they don't use that anymore so much, which is a shame. But uh, many years ago, um, you'd get a can of peaches from the store and it would be in a sugar solution in order to help preserve it. And boy, was that tasty if you have a sweet tooth like I do. All right. Um, so we've been talking about facilitated diffusion, osmosis. Those are passive processes. We depend on differences in concentration and they're, and they're, and they're based on kinetic energy of, of molecules. They just go wherever they can go and if there's a way to get there and there's a concentration difference, they will move. Active transport uses energy stored in the form of ATP to transport substances across the membrane against the concentration gradient. What if there's some solute that's very precious to the cell that can choose to invest ATP energy to transport the solute into the cell, even though the solute is much more concentrated in the cell already, can continue to capture more. That way you can capture all of the, of the precious resources outside the cell into the cell. So that's an example of active transport. There's several different types of active transport. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that, but just so you know, there's ways of transporting solutes against the concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration across the membrane using ATP energy. There's another thing called group translocation that bacteria have. We're not going to spend too much time on that either, but there's some um, enzymatic systems inside of bacteria and transporters that allow them to capture like a glucose molecule, bring it into the cell, and then uh, enzymatically modify it immediately. And essentially that changes the concentration. It's no longer a, a pure glucose molecule. It's a modified glucose molecule once it's been brought in. Uh, phosphorylation of the glucose is often the, uh, what's happening with this with this group translocation idea. This is phosphoenyl pyruvate, the driver of this process, but again, we won't really probably say too much more about that ever again. So the cytoplasm is just the water inside the cell with everything dissolved in it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's in the in a bacterial cell is the, is the nucleoid. The bacterial chromosome, we said, is a circular chromosome all wadded up inside the cell, and there's no membrane enclosing it. There's no nucleus, but there's still a, a very distinct difference in the proteins and so forth that are found around this uh, chromosome that's called the nucleoid, the region where the, nu where the, where the cyto um, chromosome lies within the cell. <clears throat> um, how about the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes? We said that prokaryotic uh, cells, bacteria, have a 70S ribosome. It actually constitutes or consists of two different um, subunits, they're called. And when you combine the, the 50S subunit and the 30S subunit, you get a 70S subunit. Now you're probably saying, okay, what's wrong with this picture? It's not math in the additive sense. It has to do with density and the movement of, of these subunits within a test tube of viscous solution in an ultra centrifuge. So don't be thinking it's just 50 plus 30 equals 70, but it's just talking about the two different subunits that together make up this complete ribosome. And so there you see assembling the two together and the ribosome, again, is the machine that allows the cell to translate RNA, messenger RNA, into uh, proteins. It's the protein-making uh, 
organelle of a cell. Just another little aside, some um, prokaryotic cells have magnetosomes, um, little inclusions uh, of actual magnetic crystals, iron uh, crystals inside the cell that are magnetic and that can help the cell organize or orient itself in a specific way. Very interesting stuff that's just kind of coming to light how that actually works in cells. Anyway, more about inclusions. <clears throat> I guess we're going to talk more about other uh, ribosomes another time. Um, inclusions are all just regions inside of the cell in which um, a, a quantity of the similar material has been accumulated. Perhaps it's something very um, valuable to the cell that it wants to have on hand. For example, uh, polysaccharide granules. That's a good source of, of energy uh, for, for oxidizing to make ATP in the future. Lipid inclusions, energy again. Um, sulfur granules. Some we said that microbes are very, very diverse in terms of what they can use for energy sources. If it's an organism that uses sulfur as an energy source, it may have a reserve some sulfur granules in there. Um, <clears throat> anyway, a bunch of different kinds of inclusions. We don't need to worry too much about that. Um, just for fun, actually, mainly just to know that there are. If you took a, a transmission electron micrograph of a bacteria, you might see some very punctate-looking spots in there that were inclusions in the cell. Endospores, on the other hand, are very, very important. So let's take a, a, a little bit of a careful look at this. Two genera of bacteria, Bacillus and Clostridium, each of which have multiple species within there, or, or specific epithets to describe them, they can produce what are called endospores. Now, endospores are not reproductive structures like spores on, on, on molds. They're just like a dormant seed-like structure in order to be able to survive a bad spell, bad patch. Let's say a, 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 one of these bacillus or clostridium bacteria finds itself in a desiccated or, uh, or nutrient-poor environment. It can shift gears and form an endospore, which can is impervious and can hold its water and, and remain uh, effectively alive for even up to thousands of years. And then when it, and that's called sporulation. And then when that endospore encounters uh, a, a moist, a nutrient-rich environment. Once again, it can begin to grow again, return to what's called the vegetative, vegetative state, this germination, just like germination of a seed. And there's a, a micrograph of an endospore. And let's take a look at what in the world we're talking about. So here's a, a, a clostridium bacterium, for example, that's going um, to it's going to sporulate. First thing it's going to do is start uh, for, replicate its genome. So, right, we've, we've replicated the chromosome. We have two identical chromosomes now in the cell. We're going to form a little, um, little boundary right there, a little um, sort of septum between the two parts of the chamber of the cell. We're going to cordon off this one of these genomes with the septum and then put a membrane around it. So now we have a, have a separate membrane around this uh, copy of the chromosome plus a bunch of enzymes that are needed to recapitulate the cell again once, when, it, when, it, when it wants to germinate. Package all that stuff in there and then put a tough peptidoglycan wall around the outside. And then even around that, put a, a, a very even tougher protein uh, um, coat around there that's waterproof. And so now we're going to, once this, the rest of the cell will just be degraded and gotten rid of, and what will be left over is this endospore that is a copy of the chromosome, a whole bunch of enzymes that can allow this thing to, to start the game rolling, uh, to get some proteins being made and start making a new bacterium. We have a cell wall. And then we have a coat on the outside. The endospore, again, is extremely tough and impervious. Problem, disease-causing bacteria that can produce endospores are very, very hard to control because it's very, very difficult to kill the endospores. So if you're talking about a medical environment in which you'd like to bring your patient into a sterile environment so they don't get infected with some already pre-existing bacteria, well, the problem is endospores are very tough to kill. So we'll be coming back to that in a big way in another chapter where we talk about controlling microbial growth, what to do about endospores. Uh, here's a little cartoon of a, of a eukaryotic cell. We can see a bunch of organelles in here, the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth, a mitochondrion right here, Golgi apparatus, a vacuole, a, a either a holding cell of some kind or just an empty area. It could be air inside there or water or uh, any number of things inside there. A chloroplast, 
All these are different organelles that could be found within this eukaryotic cell, a flagellum. Look at this little bundle of sticks it looks like in this flagellum. It's not like a, a rigid sort of stalk, like a simple bacterial flagellum. We'll see these are all microtubules, and the thing can actually move like a motorized whip using ATP. <clears throat> so here's a picture of a, a eukaryotic cell with a flagellum which can, again, that thing can whip around and make that thing swim. Or cilia are built in a similar way with a bunch of microtubules inside that can whip using ATP by way of microtubule sliding. But in this case, we have many, many hair-like cilia on the surface. This tetrahymena can really move along in the water by controlling the coordinated movement of those cilia. What's inside of there? Again, just microtubules produce of a protein called tubulin. There's individual tubulin subunits that are arranged into a sort of in a spiral way into a hollow tube, and then a bunch of the nine pairs of hollow tubes in a circle around two hollow tubes. These, these little red circles, we've cut this thing in cross section. These represent long tubules that extend the entire length of the, of the uh, flagellum, uh, and, they're, and they're able to slide on one another by the action of ATP using other proteins, and that's what allows the, the, the whip to move. So it's this nine around two arrangement of microtubules. <clears throat> How about cell walls? Plants, algae, and fungi have cell walls made up of carbohydrates, and we've already encountered those briefly in chapter one. And um, cellulose is the, the, is the glucose polymer that makes up the cell wall of most plant cells. Chitin, as we've seen, is found in the cell wall of fungi, but and yeast and fungi, but uh, glucan and mannan are also um, polysaccharides found in the cell wall of, of fungi. So these are some of the structures that would be found there. Um, and then another thing that cells may have on the surface is a polysaccharide coating, the glycocalyx. So animal cells tend to have not a cell wall, but a glycocalyx. All the proteins on the surface uh, associated with the membrane always have a lot of polysaccharides sticking out, forming like it. So all your cells in your body essentially have a sugar coating them, amazingly. They're all covered with glycoproteins. So this is glycocalyx on the outside. <clears throat> so running through some properties of cells. So we've got the phospholipid bilayer we've talked about that has all kinds of proteins associated with it. Um, integral proteins, peripheral proteins, transmembrane proteins, transporters, receptors. Sterols are a type of lipid found in uh, fungal membranes, and the glycocalyx is a polysaccharide kind of coating attached to the proteins on the surface of, a, of an animal cell. <clears throat> so the plasma membrane is, as we've said, just reviewing briefly, a semi-permeable membrane that allows only certain things to pass through. Some substances can pass through by simple diffusion, such as gases, CO2 and oxygen. Facilitated diffusion is a way of allowing larger and more charged molecules to pass through the membrane from high to low concentration by diffusion, but yet having a carrier like a, like a revolving door at a concert venue to let them through the membrane. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules through the membrane from high to low concentration, oftentimes through aquaporins. Active transport is the movement of solutes against the concentration gradient across the membrane using ATP. And finally, endocytosis is a type of active transport in which larger substances for, like particles can be transported across the membrane um, using active transport. Phagocytosis is a, an amoeba-like action of macrophages and dendritic cells and neutrophils to capture uh, foreign agents that they're defending the body against, for example, or microorganisms will use that to capture their food sources and close them into a vesicle and dissolve, di digest them, and eat them up. So phagocytosis. Pinocytosis is a way that cells grab a membrane-enclosed vesicle full of fluid from outside the cell. Just two examples of a transport we hadn't yet talked about that's a type of active transport. So that pretty much wraps up our transport discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Here's some eukaryotic cells right here, and there's some prokaryotes kind of getting involved in there, uh, in infecting those cells. Kind of tiny, aren't they? The cytoplasm is just the water inside and closed within the cell membrane. Um, not too much more to say about that, except that I would like to mention that 
Um, oftentimes you think of a cell as just a bag of water with solutes that are controlled inside versus outside. But in fact, most cells, especially eukaryotic cells, are packed full of a scaffolding of proteins called the cytoskeleton. So the actual integrity and shape of a cell is based on the cytoskeleton, not the membrane. The membrane is like putting a baggie around the whole thing just to keep it sealed, but it has no structural integrity at all. It's the cytoplasm or cytoskeleton that gives the cell its structure. Actin, you've probably heard of actin cytoskeleton, microtubules, and so forth. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about those in some future chapters, as you'll see. Um, just another, a quick observation. Some cells have very, very noticeable cytoplasmic streaming in which the cytoplasm is actually traveling like a stream through the cytoplasm in kind of a circular way and not transporting stuff from one part of the cell to the other. Again, not a super uh, critical thing for us to know in, in our context of microbiology, but just a cool thing nonetheless. Finally, coming to the eukaryotic chrome, uh, ribosomes, now we're talking about the ADS ribosome. And so this is a very different animal from the 70S ribosome that's found in prokaryotes. Interestingly, in a eukaryotic cell, we would find the same exact 70S ribosome inside of a mitochondrion or inside of a chloroplast. What? A bacterial type of a, of a ribosome is found inside the mitochondria of all your cells in your body. The ADS uh, ribosome is what all your cells use to synthesize all of its own proteins. Um, and we'll come back to this. I want to mention something about that idea. Why in the world would a mitochondrion look kind of like a bacteria, have ribosomes like a bacteria, even has its own genome like a bacterium? And we'll say more about that at the very end. First, let's just quickly review a couple of other organelles that eukaryotic cells have that we haven't talked about. The nucleus, where all of the, the genetic material is, all the chromosomes, all the DNA is in there. <clears throat> Endoplasmic reticulum is a place where when, 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 when proteins are synthesized in the ribosome, they often are inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum for chemical modification, for transport to another location in the cell, or some function. Oftentimes, the, the, the proteins will then be transported to the Golgi apparatus, and the Golgi apparatus or complex will package up all those proteins in different compartments or vesicles to send either to the cell membrane for secretion or possibly to remain inside the cell uh, as a lysosome to later digest some something that needs to be eaten up. Again, lysosomes are just vesicles filled with digestive enzymes that might be used to, to digest a bacterium that was phagocytosed by, uh, by, a, by a, a, either a, an amoeba or a, or a macrophage or something like that. Vacuoles are large enclosures within, this, within the cell which might contain food or sometimes even just water. And we'll maybe encounter some vacuoles at a later time. The mitochondrion is the place where ATP is made in a eukaryotic cell. Cellular respiration takes place in there. We use uh, um, aerobic respiration oftentimes, but not always in microbes. We can do cellular respiration in microbes oftentimes without oxygen because other chemicals can take the place of oxygen as an electron acceptor. So we're going to get used to the fact that bacteria are much more diverse uh, metabolically than, than what you're used to thinking about with animal cells and plant cells. Anyway, mitochondria is where all that energy is made. Chloroplasts the place where photosynthesis takes place and we can take energy from from uh, from light rays photons of light have energy and chloroplasts are the organelles that can actually capture that energy and make atp and possibly even uh, make sugars out of or start the process of making sugars out of, out of uh, just the energy and co2 from the atmosphere so pretty cool organelles there peroxisomes are, are a very specialized organelle within cells to do some very unusual kinds of metabolism uh, for destroying hydrogen peroxide, for example, is produced uh, during oxygen metabolism and so forth. The centrosome consists of protein fibers and centrioles. Centrioles are the place where all the um, uh, ribosomes are being synthesized within the nucleus of a cell. So here's a picture of, of, a, a, new, of a, a cell nucleus and I'm sorry, I misspoke. The nucleolus is the place where all the ribosomes are being synthesized. Here's all the chromatin. Uh, all in chromatin is the DNA that's in the nucleus of the cell. Here's the nucleolus where ribosomes are being built. Uh, the centrosome is a place where the microtubules are going to be fashioned in order to allow a eukaryotic cell to divide. The nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane. And here we see this double membrane layer. And there actually are nuclear pores that control what goes in and out of the nucleus. And it's a very 
it's a very organized and orchestrated process. It's almost like having another cell within a cell. Uh, it's very, the inside of the nucleus is a very um, privileged area, and the nuclear pores aren't just hollow openings. They are very specific for what they will allow in and out of the nucleus. So there's another little picture of the nucleus of a cell. Um, here's the nucleus of the cell. You can see it's intimately associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, and all the the ribosomes are stuck down there. There are ribosomes floating around in the cytoplasm, but a lot of them are stuck onto the endoplasmic reticulum. And as they synthesize brand new proteins from messenger RNA, the proteins are threaded into the endoplasmic reticulum where it may be modified and then entered into the, into the um, Golgi apparatus, which you don't see in this picture, to be able to pack, be packaged and sent somewhere else. This is just what's called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's just a labyrinthine organelle that has no ribosomes on it. It's where different types of lipids are synthesized. Phospholipids and various cholesterol products are made in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum as opposed to proteins being made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And there's a micrograph showing some rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. <clears throat> there's the Golgi apparatus. So once we produce a bunch of proteins and insert it into the, into the endoplasmic reticulum, then those proteins may be uh, sent over by way of vesicles over like little space pods into the Golgi apparatus where it will be uh, separated into, into, into light compartments or containers and shipped off to either be secreted at the cell membrane or, or left in the cell as a particular vesicle for, for later use. There's a little micrograph showing a eukaryotic cell on one side and a prokaryotic cell on the other side. So here's a, a nucleus of a eukaryotic cell over here and all the endoplasmic reticulum on the outside. And here's a prokaryotic cell over here. You see a chloroplast inside there and uh, some, also a, some mitochondria in there, Golgi complex. Um, all, the, a lot of, all the basic end organelles are there except no nucleus. <clears throat> Actually, this is not a prokaryotic cell. What am I saying? This is an alga, an algal cell. I was going to say there can't be any membrane enclosed in organelles in a, in a prokaryotic cell. So I just misspoke. I hope you don't get just uh, confused the rest of your life about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes on the basis of my mistake. So here's a mitochondrion. And a mitochondrion has two membranes. It has an outer membrane. And then an inner membrane is kind of folded in on itself to produce all these funny looking little zigzags in here. And again, that's the place where the, where the um, ATP is being produced in the cell. Uh, chloroplasts. Chloroplasts have a lot of infoldings of the membrane called thylakoids, stacks of which are called grana. And in there are the, the pigments, the, the uh, chloroplast pigments that allow light to be captured from the sun or from light sources and and harness that energy to make ATP or to, to fix CO2. Pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> That's all the detail. We don't need to go into more detail or worry too much about any more about cell organelles and so forth. That was probably a little overkill already. But I would like to mention something that's a very fascinating theory called endosymbiosis. And endosymbiosis is a way of thinking about maybe how cells came into being if God made them over a slow period of time which many Christians believe, and some do, some don't. But anyways, um, you can imagine uh, a, a cell being invaded by a bacterium, which ultimately, after many, many trials, might eventually remain inside the cell. And, and, and so this is now a mitochondrion, but many scientists believe that mitochondria originated as free-living bacteria, ultimately were incorporated into the cell divide right alongside that long, the, when the cell divides, bacteria divide independently, just like bacteria. They have a chromosome inside like bacteria, a circular one at that. They have a, a double membrane as if a bacterium came in and was engulfed and wrapped up by a membrane of the cell. And that outer layer of membrane is still there on the surface of the bacterium. So many different things that suggest that mitochondria are remnants of bacteria that originated as free living uh, cells on their own. Similarly with chloroplasts, photosynthetic bacteria that became ensconced inside of a cell. It also has a double membrane on the outside and so forth. It has all the features of a, um, of a photosynthetic bacterium, but it's uh, all enclosed within a, a, the organelle called a chloroplast of a cell, which then does the will, the will, the bidding, or assists the cell in producing energy 
uh, photosynthetically. Pretty cool stuff. Very fascinating theory, endosymbiosis. So just know that the theory states that um, organelles such as bacteria or back, mitochondria and chloroplast originated as free living bacteria and, and eventually became incorporated into, set into eukaryotic cells uh, that originally uh, had none in them. <clears throat> Here's another interesting observation that's, that's sort of in support of this idea of endosymbiosis as connection, the servitude almost of protozoa uh, for eukaryotic cells. Here's a picture of a eukaryotic cell, and all these little fibers on the surface are actually bacteria that are wedged into the cell membrane. They live there, and that's where they stay, and they, and they give the cell its motility by doing this spirochete spinning activity. And so that's kind of a cool thing. It's like, wait, what? So we have bacteria, that in this case, have not disappeared inside the cell and become something else. They're still there, uh, but they're attached to the cell in a very specialized connection with the cell, and that's their correct and proper location where they live, and they provide a service for the cell. This, uh, and the cells uh, can travel all around that and help the bacteria get to a place where there's lots of nice rich nutrients uh, for the purpose of their survival and replication. So that's all there is to this chapter. That's the end of our discussion of chapter four. Um, I, I, I welcome you to come and uh, meet up with me uh, in the near future. And we'll take a look at chapter five and six uh, before the end of this weekend um, as we have our first lab exam coming up uh, on, um, I guess our next lab, our, our first lecture exam, I should have said, is uh, coming up on Monday. Right now it's Friday, um, May the 19th, 2023.